You saw the title? Today we're talking about kids and vaccines. Should you give your child a vaccine against COVID-19? What are the potential side effects? How did we get to vaccines for kids so quickly and yet so much more slowly than we did for adults? We're gonna talk about all of it, but I am not an expert in immunology or vaccine creation. So today I'm joined by people who are. So this is Shelby. She studies early life vaccination and I'll let you explain. Specifically, I'm studying how one of many factors in our immune system might affect the response to BCG, the vaccine against tuberculosis. Shelby and I are gonna be going through the basics of childhood vaccines. We're also going to talk with Dr. Paul Offit, a professor of pediatrics and an attending physician at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, as well as a co-developer of our current rotavirus vaccine and a member of the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee. Right, so I'm um, one of um, 12 full-time members on the FDA's Vaccine Advisory Committee. What we typically do is in March of every year, we pick the flu strains that will go into the vaccine that will be available to the public in September. We're left alone to do the boring, nerdy things that virologists and immunologists do. Then COVID hit and suddenly, our um, FDA vaccine advisory committees are live streamed. They've been on CNN. We're a constant focus of media attention. Um, it's been um, overwhelming. There's been a lot of talk about whether or not we even need to be vaccinating kids against COVID. So at the beginning of the pandemic, they didn't really seem to be as affected by COVID-19 as adults did. So while initially children made up less of our COVID cases and appeared less at risk for severe disease, children now make up more than 24% of all COVID cases in the United States. For the whole of the pandemic, the overall rate of COVID in children is 8,498 kids per 100,000 kids in the population. And as of the October FDA report, over 8,300 children ages 5 to 11 have been admitted to the hospital for COVID, with approximately one third of those requiring the ICU. Now, while most of these recover, as of October 23rd, 97 children ages 5 to 11 have died from COVID-19. And additionally, a survey from the UK has shown that as many as 7 to 8 percent of children who get COVID are affected by PASC or long COVID. And additionally, even when they avoid hospitalization, over 5,000 children in the United States have been reported to experience Miss C. But right now, all available evidence is that we need a vaccine for children. Right now, we have about 150,000 cases a week. We have about 2,000 hospitalizations a week. Um, more than 600 children have died from this virus. This is a childhood disease. The version of the Pfizer vaccine that's been approved so far for kids ages 5 to 11 is a smaller dose of the vaccine than we are allowed to get as adults. So why is that? Is it just because kids are smaller than adults that they're getting a smaller dose? No. Kids' immune systems work differently. Young kids have immune systems which are primed for turning on inflammation right away and getting to work. These vaccines for children sometimes don't need to have as much antigen, the stuff the immune system's responding to. So you want to find the balance, and this is kind of the tenet in vaccine science, is finding the balance between what we call reactogenicity, which is your side effects, and immunogenicity, which is actually building the immune response. Okay. You want to balance that. So the idea is that we're looking for a smaller dose for kids that will still give them a high efficacy like we see in adults, but won't give them unnecessary amounts of side effects. Exactly. That is exactly the case. So the endpoint for the 5 to 11 year old trials was also different than the endpoint for adult trials. So for adults, you're looking at like cases in the placebo versus the treated group, but that's not what they were looking for in the kids' trials. So tell me why that is. Yeah. So this was an immunobridging study. So they took patient blood samples and they got uh, the serum, which is what the antibodies are in, and they compared those antibody levels in these 5 to 11 year old children to that of antibody levels seen in 16 to 25 year old vaccinated uh, participants. Because we saw antibody levels that were at about the same level as that of those older participants, we can kind of infer that there's an equivalent level of protection. 
it's great that we really have a way to look at how potentially effective this vaccine is going to be without that measure being sick kids, which yeah. none of us want. No. Do you feel like there are enough uh, participants in these trials? Is it large enough? Yeah, so that's the critical question. I mean, because you, you never know everything. The question is, when do you think you know enough to move forward? So that 12 to 15 year old trial was 2,360 children. And there were 18 cases of COVID in that, in that study, all in the placebo group. So I got a lot of pretty pointed hate mails from parents saying 2,300 children, that's it? So, so what's the answer to that? I mean, the answer to that is we could do 23,000 children, in which case it wouldn't have been 18 cases of, of children suffering COVID. Uh, in the placebo group, it would have been 180. And you know, at what what human price knowledge? I mean, this is always true. When do you know enough to say you think you have enough information? So what did they do to actually examine the vaccine dosing for kids? Well, clinical trials for the Pfizer vaccine in kids have been underway since March. They tried a number of doses, including the adult dose, a two-thirds dose, and a one-third dose, and saw that with just a third the size of the adult dose, children 5 to 11 created a comparable antibody response to adults and older adolescents and had less severe side effects than the larger dose. So this is really, really awesome, but I know that some people have been worried about potential long-term effects. And one of the things that we know about vaccines is that side effects typically appear pretty quickly after vaccination, not years or decades later. Right, because vaccines aren't like drugs. They're made to be destroyed by the body. So all of their components are gone within a couple of weeks and you're just left with the immune cells trained against some part of the virus. Any possible side effects would show up in this time while the body is building this immunity, which is why the two months of safety data was enough to start using these vaccines. Follow up for safety was the same, usually two months after the last dose, because all the safety issues, including serious safety issues that have occurred with vaccines, usually occur within in six weeks of a dose. One of the things too that I think when you move from the clinical trial out into giving this to millions of people, that's when you're gonna start picking up these yes. really rare adverse events that happen only one in a million times. You have to give the vaccine to a million people to see it. And I think the other thing that's important to keep in mind is that everybody doesn't get the vaccine on the same exact day. So even though it might seem like these events are happening, you know, three or four months out, it's still usually only less than two weeks after that specific person got Absolutely. the vaccine. It's just that we're rolling out to all these people over time. Absolutely, that's such an important concept to keep in mind. So we've, we've been at vaccines really since the smallpox vaccine in the late 1700s. So we have a lot of experience with vaccines. And vaccines certainly can cause serious and occasionally the kind of side effects that cause permanent harm or death. True, the oral polio vaccine could cause polio, it was rare, roughly one per 2.4 million doses, but real. The yellow fever vaccine can cause something called viscerotropic disease, which is a nice way of saying yellow fever. Natural viruses also generally do all these things as well. The, the important thing to note here is that in all cases, all cases, those side effects occur within six weeks of a dose. So the notion of this sort of long-term effect, the thing that you realize 10 years later, or 20 years later, has never existed. So any adverse side effects from these vaccines, we're gonna see them very quickly. Examples that we've seen so far in older adolescents and adults have been things like anaphylaxis and myocarditis. It's important to note that all of these are not only extremely rare, but also treatable. The, the group that had the highest risk of myocarditis was the 16 to 17 year old male, um, where the risk was as, as high as one in 5,000, which is still rare, but not as rare as for the general population. I mean, the, the good news about myocarditis, if there's any good news to be had, you know, with something that caused inflammation of your heart muscle, it's that it was really short-lived, self-resolving and transient. I mean, we, we saw a few children in our hospital, you know, and they, they just did well on their own. I mean, some kind of got anti-inflammatory, some didn't, they all got better. And also you should realize that, that SARS-CoV-2 virus also causes myocarditis. I mean, COVID is associated with myocarditis at a rate much greater than this. I mean, there was a study in, it was reported in JAMA Cardiology of athletes in the Big Ten Conference who had COVID, all of whom got cardiac MRIs. And 
roughly 2.5% had evidence of myocarditis, you know, so that's like one in 45, which is a lot more common than one in 5,000. So I think you, there are never risk-free choices, just choices to take different risks. And the trick is to always take the lesser risks. The whole reason why the FDA and the CDC and so many people have done work into looking at this data is to weigh the risks between the potential side effects from getting the vaccine and the potential side effects and long-term repercussions of getting COVID. And in all of these cases so far for all of the age groups that they have looked at, it is so much better to get the vaccine with these incredibly rare side effects than it is to get COVID. Absolutely, because I mean, you can't live in a bubble. Nobody right. is living in isolation, able to avoid potential exposure. We can limit our exposures, but there's always a chance. And so your question is, do you want to be exposed with some protection? Or do you want to be exposed without it and risk all of these long-term events that we know happen and that go beyond just myocarditis? They extend into very serious complications. Right. And then additionally, it's like, you don't know when you're exposed to COVID. You might not know for a week or two weeks, but you know exactly when you got that vaccine and right. knowing what the things you need to watch out for gives you just a lot of agency in your own health and in those decisions. I love that. I love the idea that getting the vaccine is a way of having agency over your own health. I think Absolutely. that's so important because that, that's what we all want, that's right? We want. we want to have some control over our health. And I feel like, gosh, over the past year, it's been very scary. We yeah. felt out of control in a lot of ways. So I think getting this vaccine for yourself and for your kids, if you have kids, is a, is a way of getting back that agency for your health and your yeah. family's health. We do see our children as particularly vulnerable. And so it does, it just feels wrong to sort of pin them down and inoculate them with a biological that you don't understand. And so I understand the pushback, but um, you know, I work in a hospital and you see a lot of parents crying in that hospital and, um, and they all wish they had vaccinated their children that was over 12. If you still have questions or concerns about the vaccines, your regular care provider or pediatrician can talk with you more about your or your child's specific situation and help you make the best choice for you and your family. So we hope that this was helpful. We'll put updated information in the description below. And I wanna say thank you to everybody who helped me make this video. So thank you to you for coming out to Los Angeles to join me and for helping put all of this information together. And a big thank you to Dr. Paul Offit for talking with us and sharing his expertise. As always, thank you to you for watching and remember to go forth and do science and get vaccinated.